drug that could have revolutionized peripheral artery disease therapy, metformin, just failed spectacularly in a major clinical trial. After eight years and 202 patients, the answer is crystal clear. It doesn't work. But the story of why is far more interesting than the headline. Stay with me as we break down the PERMET trial and what it tells us about drug development, clinical trial design, and the future of PAD treatment. Let's set the stage. Peripheral artery disease is a devastating condition. Millions of people suffer from it worldwide. It's progressive, disabling, and most importantly, there are almost no treatments that actually work. Right now, if you have claudication, that's leg pain when you walk, your only FDA-approved medication is Solostazol. But Solostazol? The effects are modest at best. We need better options. Enter metformin. Now I know what you're thinking. Metformin? That's just a diabetes drug. But here's where it gets interesting. Preclinical research showed that metformin has pleiotropic effects. It activates AMPK, which stimulates nitric oxide production, improves blood flow, reduces oxidative stress, and enhances mitochondrial function. All things that are broken in PAD. Small clinical trials hinted that metformin might actually work. So a team of researchers asked the obvious next question. What if we ran a proper, randomized, controlled trial? This is that trial. The research question was deceptively simple. Does metformin improve six-minute walk distance at six months compared to placebo in people with PAD who don't have diabetes? Why exclude diabetics? Because metformin already has cardiovascular benefits in diabetes. That would muddy the waters. They wanted to isolate whether metformin could help just through its non-glycemic effects. The six-minute walk test was their chosen outcome because it's objective, validated, and clinically meaningful. A meaningful change in PAD is considered 8 to 20 meters. Keep that number in mind. It's crucial. This was a multi-center RCT across four U.S. sites, recruited across nearly eight years, eight years to enroll 202 patients. Of 740 people screened, 538 were excluded, 73% exclusion rate. Why? Extensive exclusion criteria, no diabetes, no kidney disease, no cognitive impairment, etc. Then they did something smart a run-in period where everyone took metformin 500 milligrams for 14 days to assess tolerability before randomization. This was important because it weeded out people who couldn't tolerate the drug. Finally, 202 people were randomized, 97 to metformin, 105 to placebo. 89% completed six-month follow-up. That's excellent for a clinical trial. The metformin group took 1,000 milligrams daily for two weeks, then escalated to 2,000 milligrams daily the standard therapeutic dose. Identical placebo pills maintained blinding. Stratification was smart. They randomized by site, baseline walking distance, and glucose status. The population had an average age of 69 with about 28% female, which is actually lower than typical for PAD trials. Average ABI of 0.64, meaning moderate to severe disease. Baseline six minute walk around 358 meters. These weren't the mildest cases selected. Primary outcome was six-minute walk distance at six months, but they also measured treadmill times, quality of life scores, and vascular function. This was comprehensive. Statistically, intention to treat analysis, and COVA adjusting for site and baseline. They were powered to detect a 28-meter difference between groups. Now here's the problem. That's larger than the MCID. They needed a bigger effect to see significance. And here's the punchline. Between group difference of the six-minute walk distance was 1.1 meters, not 20 meters, not 10 meters, one meter. P-value was 0.90. To put this in perspective, the 95% confidence interval crossed zero and extended in both directions. There's absolutely no signal here. Both groups got slightly worse, and they got worse at almost exactly the same rate. This is what we call a null result, and it's a clean one. The investigators acknowledge this in the paper. These results do not support metformin for improving walking performance in patients with PAD. That's academic understatement for this drug doesn't work. Let's check the secondary outcomes. Maximal treadmill time, no difference. WIQ distance score, that's self-reported walking difficulty, no difference. WIQ speed score, no difference. SF36 physical functioning, no difference. Flow-mediated dilation, a direct measure of vascular function, no difference. In sensitivity analysis, they combined all the secondary outcomes together. 
combined p-value 0.49, still nothing. They also reported adverse events. The important one, indigestion and stomach upset, occurred in 65% of the metformin group versus 41% in placebo. And 20% of metformin patients discontinued due to GI side effects versus 10% in placebo. So metformin caused harm without providing benefit. That's the opposite of what we want. Now, I want to be fair. This is a good study. Don't let the null result fool you. The methodology was rigorous. First, proper randomization, stratification, and double blinding. Pre-specified analysis plan finalized before data review. 89% follow-up. That's high quality. Second, the population is clinically relevant. 40% were black, representing real-world diversity. They had actual PAD, not borderline disease, but true lower extremity ischemia. Third, comprehensive outcomes. Objective walking tests and patient-reported measures. Vascular function assessment. Multiple validated instruments. If metformin worked, they would have found it. This is the gold standard for a negative trial. We should trust this result. But there are real limitations worth discussing. First, power and sample size. They stopped at 95% enrollment due to funding. They recruited 202 instead of 212. That's not a huge difference, but it matters statistically. More importantly, they were powered to detect 28 meters, but, but clinically meaningful change is 8 to 20 meters. They needed a larger effect to show significance. Could a 15-meter difference, clinically real, have been missed? Possibly. Second, enrollment barriers. Seven years to recruit. Extensive exclusion criteria. They excluded people with kidney disease, diabetes, and cognitive impairment. This limits generalizability. The trial is relevant to PAD patients without these comorbidities, which is probably 30 to 40% of all PAD patients. Third, dosing. The actual mean dose achieved was with 1322 milligrams daily, not 2000 milligrams. 20% of patients discontinued due to GI side effects. So the metformin group on average was underdosed. Fourth, missing data. They collected muscle biopsies from participants intended to study AMPK activation and mitochondrial changes, but never analyzed them due to lack of funding. That's a real missed opportunity for mechanistic insights. Finally, both groups declined. Why? That's odd. Usually you see a placebo effect or improvement with attention. The decline in both groups suggests possible regression to the mean or population drift over the seven-year enrollment period. So what does this mean for us as clinicians? The bottom line, do not prescribe metformin to improve walking performance in PAD patients. There's no evidence it works. Celastazole remains your option, though effects are modest. The real takeaway isn't metformin doesn't work. It's that we still don't have good medical therapies for PAD. Most management is exercise therapy, which is proven. Some centers now use supervised walking programs. That's actually more effective than pills. But for research, this trial raises fascinating questions. First, why did metformin fail when preclinical evidence was so promising? The authors proposed something interesting. Maybe AMPK is already maximally activated in PAD because of ischemic conditions. Low oxygen tension naturally drives AMPK activation. If that's true, metformin can't activate it further. Second, what does this tell us about other AMPK activators? Should we avoid them? The paper suggests no, but it does redirect us to other pathways. They mention nicotinamide riboside and cocoflavanols, which showed promise in preliminary trials using different mechanisms. Third, interestingly, other research found that metformin can blunt the benefits of exercise therapy in older adults. It inhibits muscle hypertrophy and mitochondrial adaptations to exercise. Could that explain the null finding here? We don't know. Looking forward, this trial tells us that AMPK activation alone isn't the answer for PAD. Future trials should focus on P13K pathways, NAD plus metabolism, and other mitochondrial targets. So here's some food for thought. Should we test metformin in pay patients with diabetes? They were excluded from this trial, but metformin has other cardiovascular benefits in diabetics. Does a rigorously designed negative trial change your practice? Many clinicians might have tried metformin anyway. This trial should stop that. What do you think? Will this change your practice? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. Subscribe for more evidence-based journal club critiques, and thanks for watching.